Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the session Business and Human Rights in Asia from the first decade to the next. My name is Livio Sarandrea, and I'm UNDP Global Lead on Business and Human Rights and the program, sub, a program advisor of Business and Human Rights in Asia, a regional initiative supporting the implementation of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights in 12 countries in Asia. I'm joined today by an exceptional uh, panel of experts uh, representing governments, uh, the business sector and civil society, which I'm going to introduce one by one uh, in a minute. I prepare some questions naturally uh, for them as I am the moderator, but importantly in the second part of this session, the panelists will be ready to comment and answer questions posed from the virtual floor, posed from you participants. So, I encourage you all to use the function embedded in the forum platform uh, that allows you to interact uh, with, with us, with the panelists, and post questions or comments. So if you are looking at your screen right now and you, if you are on the main platform, on your right side, you should find a Q&A button. You can click there and without leaving the, the session, you can pose questions. I will be monitoring uh, those questions and comments regroup them if necessary, and depending on the time available, I will pose them to, to the relevant speaker or, or speakers indeed, because questions may be posed to more than one speaker. If you want, you can identify the speaker that you are uh, posing the question to. The theme of this session to them is, is I assume, and I hope well known by those connecting, uh, we will use the, the 90 minutes, uh, more or less, that were allocated uh, to us to celebrate the progress made uh, during the first 10 years of implementation of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. But perhaps even more importantly, uh, we'll use them to acknowledge the challenges that lie ahead of all of us and discuss how to accelerate the responsible business uh, agenda in the next, uh, in the next decade. Uh, certainly, we'll, we'll I'll try to look at how to go beyond uh, preaching to, to the converted uh, or, uh, and, and, and certainly aim at looking at how to reach those left most behind. The UNGPs, as I'm sure uh, uh, most of you know, were endorsed unanimously by the Human Rights Council on 21st of June 2011. And a formal celebration is in fact uh, planned for later uh, this month, I believe not exactly the, the 21st, a bit later, uh, but the chairperson of the UN Working Group, uh, uh, Dante Pesce, who is one of our panelists uh, today, I'm sure will, will tell us uh, more about it and, and invite you to the very formal event. The UN Working Group launched, uh, again, in, in a project led by, by Dante, uh, uh, a project called UNGP 10 Plus. Uh, project was launched uh, around uh, 12 months ago with the aim of doing exactly what we are doing today. Reflect on the first 10 years of implementation uh, of business and human rights globally, of course, in their, in their case. And as, as a, a result of this um, analysis, uh, a report would be presented again in June to the Human Rights Council and later on, I believe, uh, certainly before the end of the year, also a roadmap for the implementation of the UNGP <clears throat> in the next 10 years uh, will also be made available with the contribution of, of, of those that, that uh, have been part of it and, and no doubt many of you have been part of that consultation. Now, UNDP along with OHCHR and many other actors have partnered uh, with the working group in this process. And our contribution has been uh, in two forms, mainly. We, we have organized a number of regional dialogues in, very, uh, in many parts of the world, but also <clears throat> we commissioned three regional studies uh, that look at the status of business and human rights in Asia, in Africa, and, and in the Arab states region. Well, I'll take this opportun the opportunity of, of, of this conversation today to launch the first of these studies, the one obviously focusing on, on Asia. The reports on Africa and, and Arab states will also be made uh, available uh, shortly and, and through our website you, you'll be informed when these reports are, are um, ready. 
So allow me to kickstart our discussion today with a very brief summary of the findings of this study, which was authored by Dr. Matthew Mullen and his team of researchers. I take the opportunity to uh, greet, uh, uh, I hope he's, he's with us today, and I certainly thank Dr. Matthew Mullen for a very hard uh, work that he's done. The full text of the report will be made available on our website. It, I believe it should be available today or shortly after. So if the technical facilitator can help me in, in showing three quick slides, that will make it easier for me to go into some of the very highlights of what the report says. So, and, and as you can imagine, uh, um, taking an absolute comprehensive picture of, of uh, the status of business human rights in Asia was too complex and, 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 and perhaps uh, too long. So, uh, the reflections and the directions, the title that uh, we have given to the report is Reflections and Directions, focuses mainly on 11 countries that had demonstrated greater progress on business and human rights. They are those that you see highlighted in there. Those are also the countries where UNDP is specifically programming. But not only those countries. You will find a lot of connections, obviously, with the rest of Asia, since the supply chains are obviously very much uh, connected. But again, the, the more specific focus is in those 11 countries. The study is based on a desk research, uh, obviously, but also, more importantly, uh, more than 100 in-depth interviews with uh, civil society actors, which we wanted to prioritize, but also uh, members of, of the business sector, governments, trade unions, and other experts. I take the opportunity of thanking all those that have been interviewed by Dr. Mullen. I, I'm sure that many of you are, are tuned into this session. Uh, the analysis that came out of this is based, therefore, on facts and figures, which normally have a role, but also uh, very much on lived experiences and insights. That's what we really wanted to bring into the discussion. Next slide, please. All right, so I, I have, uh, again, the report is very extensive in its length, uh, but I, I, I'm giving you just some of the highlights and here I'm highlighting four of, of the, uh, so to speak, uh, glass half full parts, uh, right, of the analysis. And, and, we, and I'm highlighting four, four things that are considered to be progress so far in the first 10 years. In fact, I would say probably in the, in, in the, in the, the last five years, because it is my view that a real business and human rights discourse in Asia started uh, uh, later than it started in other parts of the world. It really started in 2016, as far as at least I'm concerned. So in the last five years, we have seen four things which give us some optimism. Number one, the business and human rights is an increasingly established discourse, which is replacing the, the CSR approach of, of, of mostly philanthropic nature, if you want. Now, business and human rights is, is an expression that is used, but beyond the very semantic, the discourse about responsible business is not just about philanthropy, but it's about really ensuring that human rights are respected, uh, promoted, and, and of course, redressed uh, when, when they do occur um, uh, throughout uh, the chains. The second point uh, that was highlighted in the report is that uh, uh, companies are adopting in increased number human rights policies and engaging, again, in increased number in due diligence. There's been a progress in that direction. I'm not claiming and or saying here the report doesn't say that there's a widespread human rights due diligence being applied, but there's been certainly a, a great uh, a increase in that as um, the consequence of a discourse that has accelerated. The third uh, visible progress is the NAPS, the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, another business, uh, responsible business policies adopted by a number of countries. You will see that both point two and three on human rights due diligence NAPS come back also in the challenges because certainly we registered the progress in that regard, but there are challenges because those processes are incomplete. Uh, when it comes to NAP, of course, we, we're, we're, we're looking at as a challenge, the implementation of NAPS. But again, certainly, a, an important step ahead in terms of policies passed by a number of governments. 
The fourth uh, progress that I want to highlight here is the partnership architecture in support of the business human rights agenda, which is growing. And if I may, among many examples, I'll point exactly to this responsible business and human rights forum, an event that uh, gathered in 2016 uh, 120 people, uh, if I remember correctly, and 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 as 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 uh, uh, brought in uh, last year more than 6,000 people in it. Uh, if we look at the partnership of, of, of for example, this year forum, uh, uh, we had more than 40 uh, organizations partnering on that. Indeed, eight UN actors on it. So the tent the tent is 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 growing, and and that has obviously an impact in the discourse. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing here to uh, some gaps and challenges and not surprisingly, there are many more of the progress. Uh, and believe me, there are many more of these gaps and challenges highlighted in, in, in the report. But let me quickly go through that. We don't really have uh, too much time at the beginning and I don't wanna take time, which is precious to talk to the speakers, but just to give you the headlines of, uh, the, the, the headlines of it. The report talks about a business in your agenda that has not sufficiently reached those who need it the most. One of the, the most uh, common words used over and over by the informants is power imbalance, right? So this is probably the biggest problem that the discourse has in Asia. Uh, power imbalances between uh, um, uh, powerful states and, and disempowered rights holders in many cases or powerful companies and not sufficiently em empowered uh, employees. So again, power imbalance is, 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 is one of the words that really characterizes the analysis by Dr. Mullen. Second, there is a disconnect between the business and human rights and other social movements like the one on climate change, on the environment. So a little bit of silos in there. Third gaps and challenge, large areas of Asia still uncovered or with very slow progress. I have highlighted 11 countries in the first slide where progress is taking place slowly. There are many other areas of Asia where the discourse has, has almost not started yet or, 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 is, or is going at a very slow progress. Uh, fourth point on gaps and challenge, human rights due diligence still mostly cosmetic and superficial. I mentioned human rights due diligence as a progress. I must mention it also as um, a challenge because it's still at a too early stage. Fifth gap highlighted is the harassment of human rights uh, defenders, the killing of some of those that unfortunately all of us know a lot about is something that is certainly very alarming and, it, and it's a gap that the next decade we'll have to look at very closely. Fifth point, laws often not aligned with NAPs or other policies. There are some other countries where quite frankly, NAPs are being approved or are in the process of being approved, but legislation, so the policy commitment seems strong, but legislation adopted doesn't seem aligned with that same uh, uh, commitment. So again, policy incoherence in this case. Uh, Seventh point, business and rights discourse did not reach SMEs almost at all. And of course, the informal sector. Uh, well, that will have to be a big focus next decade. Last point, uh, a slow uh, down or stall of the progress uh, that has taken place in the first years due to the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that had an impact on many discourses, including ours. My last slide, uh, and I invite you to see many more of these uh, quotes that I put in the last slides that looks at uh, some of the, uh, of, of the recommendations, the, the reporting reach of, of uh, recommendations on how to move forward uh, in the next uh, uh, decade. And I'll mention just a few of them, others you can read them, uh, and I'll definitely uh, highlight the point made over and over in the report of galvanizing bottom-up change by rallying around the Asia's vast and rich network of grass, grassroots organization and human rights defenders. I'm, I'm quoting here because it's a very important point to make. And there's a need to turn them into BHR experts and allies and give them the legitimacy and the space uh, to speak. There's the also a need of leveraging force multiplier and institutions like banks, schools, law schools, legal aid networks, and many, many others. So expand the tent further. 
lastly, and I'll, 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 I'll point to a need to recalibrate the discourse by pairing the top-down leadership with bottom-up change from the grassroots. So you'd see that I'm, I'm repeating uh, some of the issues, but it's important to stress them. The, the, the report and the informants indeed acknowledge the progress made. They understand that the, the top down was crucial to create a discourse. Is now the time to change gear and bring in the, the grassroots uh, element uh, more at the, at the forefront. I'll, I'll stop by saying that there is indeed a strong need to engage more with countries that are behind in adopting the business and human rights policies based on the UNGPs. We'll come to some of these points in more detail uh, uh, in the questions I'll pose to, to the panelists. So I'll stop here as far as this um, little appetizer uh, uh, to, to break the ice on, on uh, the uh, first and the next decade uh, of business and human rights in Asia. And I'll, I'll uh, allow me to uh, bring in the panelists, uh, the, the experts. And I, I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Dante Pesce, uh, chairperson of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. That Dante is, is connecting, uh, I believe, from Santiago in Chile, where, where uh, it's currently, I believe, already a new day. It's past midnight. So I want to give him a special thank uh, on behalf of all the co-organizers for, for being with us, Dante. So Dante, I said earlier, the, the UN Working Group is finalizing uh, this 12-month process to look at the first and the next decade of UNGP's implementation globally. You, have, I believe, also received earlier access to the findings of, uh, of, uh, of the report of Dr. Uh, Matthew Mullen, uh, and, and I've given some of the highlights now also as a reminder. Now, as someone who um, also knows this region well, I, I should point out that you and I were in the first of these forums in 2016 uh, organized in Singapore by the ASEAN CSR Network uh, with UNDP and others. So you've been in, and, and you've been in each of these forums. So you've been able to look at the trajectory. Uh, and I know you, in between forums, of course, you monitor this, this, uh, um, this, this very well. So um, how, how, how does this, this, uh, how do these points that I just made speak to the global uh, uh, um, issues that you've been uh, research? Uh, how, um, yeah, how do these priorities speak to the global ones, especially in the context of a subject, business and human rights, which is globally uh, interconnected, right, as, as, as uh, global supply chains are. So the floor is yours, um, Dante. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, uh, Livio and all the organizers. Thank you for inviting me again to join you in your annual forum in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm in Santiago, Chile. It's uh, 12. 48 a.m. Uh, on Tuesday, so it's kind of late or early, depends how you look at it. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to, to join you. I have a slightly structured um, presentation to share with you that can be distributed. Uh, but actually, before going in something a little bit uh, formal, I would like to react um, slightly informally to what uh, Livio just presented. And to, and to reinforce a few messages that I think uh, are, are pertinent to this conversation. Um, one thing is that uh, Livio pointed out to this process, the stock taking exercise to learn from the first 10 years of implementation of the guiding principles. And the good news, and I'm fully in agreement with Livio, is that we are in a half full glass conversation. All stakeholders from all around the world we had more than 200, about 250 submissions. We had uh, dozens and dozens of consultations. We piggyback on events all around the world. And we had all stakeholders submitting their comments and engaging from the employers and chambers of commerce to indigenous people, unions uh, and governments from all around the world. Um, so we had a very, very extensive uh, engagement and today uh, we have an agreement that we have the same foundations. All stakeholders agree that the guiding principles are foundational and are authoritative for all of us. There is disagreement on the level of how full the glass is. Um, let's say the business community uh, tends to be a little bit uh, more positive 
and uh, civil society unions and indigenous people uh, tend to be a little bit more negative in their appreciation and from where they stand. But nevertheless, they all agree that we have the foundations, we have learned and moved from pioneers, and we are at the pioneer level. We have been able to move away from Geneva to regions of the world, and we have processes taking place and getting enrooted in different regions, uh, notably Southeast Asia. So we have the foundations for a next decade of a great, much greater ambition. We have been able to grow the tent. We have been able to align the narrative. We have been able to agree on due diligence as entry point, including ILO and OECD. So it's not just us and the stakeholders around the guiding principles, but other international organizations. We are looking at a regulatory wave taking place mostly in Western Europe, but we expect it to trigger down to other parts of the world. And, and we're also seeing uh, a very, very fast uh, uptake of the S of ESG by analysts, uh, risk analysts, investors, institutional investors, mostly in the most developed and sophisticated economic markets. But again, uh, we expect it to have, um, um, let's say, to trigger the same movement that is take, starting to take place in some other places, less developed countries or middle income countries around the world. So in, in, in short, uh, my perspective is a positive one in terms that we have uh, reached a point where we can aspire to be much more ambitious. Uh, and, that, and that is the key element. On the 16th of June, um, I will have the honor um, to initiate the celebration of the first 10 years of, of the guiding principles, and we will release the stock taking report in all UN languages the same day. The report is ready. Uh, it's, it's finalized in the, in the translation. And I will present to the Human Rights Council the findings of this report on the 28th of uh, June. So we will present the findings on the 16th and we will have a series of events during the next uh, couple of days. This is somehow a soft launch of what the findings are. Uh, in this conversation, we'll initiate a process that Livio already highlighted where we will build the roadmap into the future invite all stakeholders to raise their own ambition and to look into the next decade um, um, with way more ambitious based on the lessons and the learning of the first decade of implementation. We will wrap up, we will finalize this process of raising ambition on the 10th annual forum on business and human rights that will take place the last two days of November and December 1st this year. And that will be the occasion to wrap up this process. Um, and I will just want to say that uh, Livio just presented in the findings, um, the findings in Asia are very consistent with the findings all over the world with some notable differences. One in particular is the power imbalance. That is something that doesn't pop up in Western Europe, North America naturally. That, that seems not to be a big issue, the power imbalance, in terms of stakeholder dialogue and the power of unions and, and how you challenge power overall, uh, the authorities or the big companies, etc. And the other element is informality. On, on, on all the elements that Livio just presented, I will say is absolutely consistent with what is uh, happening and what is uh, showing up all around the world but with these two notable differences. The power imbalance in Latin America clearly is something that uh, uh, pops up very uh, easily and immediately, um, and the, the informal sector uh, conversation. Uh, you have to, it's just a reminder, 60% of the workers of the world work in, in, in the informal sector, so, and, and almost all of them uh, happens to work in the uh, global south or the developing world where most of us are and live. So that is a key issue. And of course, uh, the, the issues that uh, Livio just presented uh, have different levels of priority, depends where you are. Example, um, the defense of human rights defenders, 
and, and how they risk their life and, and, their, and the probability to be killed. Well, nine of the 10th most dangerous countries in the world for human rights defenders are Latin Americans. Um, so uh, it's all around my region where most part of the human rights defenders get killed. And, and of course, that is a priority for our civil society and our human rights defenders, our unions or our indigenous people. And it's not the same priority in Europe. So just to say that despite that Europe is leading uh, this uh, wave of new regulation to come or the ESG push, that is uh, going to and is going to be mandatory um, by uh, on sustainability reporting with the new framework, mandatory framework that is being developed in Europe. Uh, we risk a little bit to lose the global perspective, in which Europe, Western Europe, counts for about six percent of the global population, but the other ninety-four percent is not Western European. And, and, we, and we struggle a little bit not to be captured by the tremendous enthusiasm that we see in policymakers and business and civil society in Europe to lose the perspective that we need everyone to be on board. So we are in a, I will say, we need to balance, to push the, 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 the frontier to continue to go and to, and to innovate and to be two, three, four, five steps ahead. But then us, that, that or UNDP or all of us in this call, we need to make sure that they don't that, that they keep running and that's fine and that's good and we welcome that. But at the same time, make sure that everyone else is on board and moving in the same direction. And and that is something that uh, concerns me quite a bit uh, because uh, we might uh, get into the situation where locals will say. The Europeans are kind of different than us. They are way ahead of us, and this is an impossible task. Therefore, instead of trying harder, I might decide to give up um, and just don't try. And, and so that is an area where we need to put more attention. The other area that is uh, showing up is around um, protectionism and, um, and, um, and, let's say, or Western cultural imposition that I'm starting to hear more and more. For me, that sounds as an excuse to not deliver and do what we need to do our, ourselves, the Latin Americans or the Asians, what we need to do at home. Um, but that also is expressing this feeling that somehow the Europeans are a little bit too much ahead and we are starting to look after excuses uh, to not do our part. And, and that is, of course, something that I'm trying to um, to show and, and, to, and, to, and to tell uh, as clear as possible to not hide behind excuses to not do our part. And one final uh, element that um, we have been finding in this uh, analysis is the, the risking risk. Um, if a company wants to run and be um, in, a, in any kind of rating, very high in terms of their sustainability score for the sake of uh, investors' uh, risk analysis, the easiest way is don't do business with SMEs or completely move away from risky countries. So middle, low, low income countries just fly out and don't do business there. And you will uh, effectively be a more sustainable company, but the problems will remain or might even worsen. Um, so that is also a risk that we are seeing um, as we move in the, and we are moving in the right direction, which is really good. Um, we face some risks as the ones that I'm, I'm presenting. And I just want to wrap up uh, this uh, intervention saying, as, as uh, Livio were describing challenges identified in Asia, is that it's key to understand the challenges and the underlying cultural factors that are connected to those challenges, because the challenges are not in a vacuum. The challenges have to be understood in a cultural, historical context in order to be able to address them, uh, to uh, uh, tackle them. And so if we understand the challenges, we have made a lot of progress because we have the potential to address them. And if we understand the underlining 
uh, elements that uh, justify or, or um, help us understand those challenges, then we might have a solution in front of us. Um, because all challenges are cultural and contextual sensitive. And, and that is something that locals everywhere in the world will know much better than any international so-called expert in how to address uh, a societal challenge in any given local context. And for that sake, you are the most important people in the future, the champions that are actually uh, patiently and systematically doing the daily work at home, uh, allowing all of us to understand what are these challenges and thinking hard and how to address those challenges uh, looking into the next decade. So I completely skip my uh, intervention um, and some people spend a lot of time preparing the intervention, but I got, uh, let's say, in, in so engaged with the introduction from Livio and I just followed that flow and, and sp uh, spoke up and, and my mind and it's what I did. So thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dante. <clears throat> I know you, and when you when you speak off the cuff, you actually give your best, and this is not to diminish the importance of uh, those that have helped you in drafting the, the official statement, uh, uh, whom I also know well. But thank you for an extremely rich analysis, a good balance of uh, it's sort of encouraging statements, but also warnings and, and call for action. I, I particularly uh, liked and was intrigued by your analysis on the race to the top between regions. Race to the top is, is a word that had come up a lot within the region. So your analysis on how the race to the top between regions can present challenges is very important. And hopefully, maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have some time to come back to that. And, and very importantly, the issue of the risking the risk. Uh, among many of the great points you made, Dante, thank you, thank you very much for for that. We have accumulated a little bit of, of delay, but uh, it, it was absolutely useful. If I can ask then the, the next speakers to stick within the time allocated, we'll we'll make sure there is time for questions and answers, and some are starting to come. So, let me turn now to Sumi Danarajan, Associate Director of the Asia Pacific Forum for the Future a lawyer and a development practitioner with, with long commitment to, to social justice. Now, Sumi, the informants of the research, uh, and not only those that represent a civil society, I have to say, spoke about a busy human rights movement in Asia, which is, and I'm quoting here, struggling to reach the affected rights holders. And, 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 and they stress the need to recalibrate, that's a word uh, used, uh, the approach, adding more emphasis on a bottom-up approach to complement an effort which has been mostly top-down until now. I, I made reference to that at the beginning. So the report speaks also about uh, the need of the business human rights movement to learn from other social movements, such as the one on climate change, that have been more successful, perhaps, in, in leveraging activism. So, what are your reflections on, on these uh, uh, points, uh, Sumi? You have the floor. Thank you, Livio, and, and thank you, Dante. I, I also appreciate when Dante goes off the, off the cuff because it, it's, there's so much richness in that. And let me try and uh, pick up on some of the points and build on them. But before I start, uh, please may I commend the team for creating the space for a dialogue around tough challenges and, and for a very real and, and sobering assessment of the steps we've taken forward, uh, steps that we've taken backwards, and, and where we have stood still to date. Um, Livia, you've presented me rather a lot to, to cover, so in the interest of time, I'm going to focus my comments particularly on this aspect of how we recalibrate our approach to foreground bottom-up approaches in contrast to the top-down approaches that have prevailed to date, as the report has found. So over the last uh, decade, we have crafted and implemented interventions that we believe will help us to achieve our vision of a, of a region in which businesses does not abuse human rights and on the rare occasion that it happens, that victims have access to, to remedies. And we have been guided in our choices, as you said, uh, of our interventions by the UNGPs as a, as a set of norms. Now, if we're seeking to recalibrate then the task at hand must be a, a critical diagnosis into whether 
the actions we have taken over the last 10 years have brought us closer to our preferred future that we envisioned? Or have they, unintended or not, had the effect of entrenching an old system with its structures and power dynamics that enable the abuses that keep the existing economic engine functioning? You know, have our actions kept business as usual intact, albeit slightly improved? So to recalibrate, we will need to question some of our assumptions that underpin the choices that we have made to date. And only then can we start to paint a picture as to whether our interventions as a business and human rights movement in this region have in fact contributed to constraining grassroots or bottom-up approaches. I'll offer some thoughts on the assumptions that we may need to examine, and these are by no means uh, exhaustive. Um, just some thoughts that can fit into the next uh, four minutes or so. So firstly, there's an assumption that we've made that top-down approaches have always prevailed in this region. If I look back to the late 90s when I started uh, working in this space, the most active actors in the BHR space were civil society actors. They were the ones that were raising the concerns and in fact interacting with business where government was not about, for example, worker abuses in supply chains long before any other actor was involved, let alone driving that agenda. Now, however, the assumption seems to be that the leadership comes from top down. So the question we have to ask is, well, what happened in the last 10 years that has made those bottom up approaches less powerful than, than when, we, when this movement start, when this movement was birthed in the region? We have to ask what caused this situation that we're now trying to correct. Now, could it be that the assumption about the first step needing to be about gaining buy-in from government and corporate leaders in Asia has in fact in some way contributed to dis disabling our ability to reach right holders, best achieved through those ground up means. That had, if we'd made our first steps about nurturing civil society leadership. Instead, we might have been in a different, better place in that regard. Now, that's a hard question to have to hear and then probably a harder one to have to answer. But I think that unless we are willing to ask that question, we might not be able to have clear sight on what pathways uh, for recalibration might look like. Asking that question, might we then consider an alternative framing for the business and human rights system where we see civil society bottom-up leadership to be core and with top-down approaches designed with the goal of oxygenating that leadership rather than competing with it? Ultimately, I think the tough but necessary focus for this region over the next period is to test the mettle of our business and human rights movement in actively defending civic space, which is undoubtedly under threat. And asking where are we seeing evidence of the BHR movement doing that so far? There is, but let's name that. And then also asking the question whether the movement is creating barriers or distractions from this, and if so, why? When we scan the Asian panoramic today, we see acute struggles to defend civic space. They involve youth, mainly focus on de defending civil rights and outing systemic structural discrimination and ensuing inequalities, mainly calling out dysfunctional political systems where social contracts are being broken. And we are seeing this tragically manifesting as we struggle to overcome COVID and the systemic maelstrom that touches upon every aspect of our lives today and will do in the future. How is the business and human rights movement turning up in these struggles? When I look across the region, I see a proliferation of activities around environmental sustainability. But the conversations around human rights are still peripheral for most businesses and where existent, heavily dominated by a risk management, mainly reputational risk management framing. Getting involved in supporting what is seen as political protests is seen as high level risk. And we have to ask as a business, human, uh, business and human rights movement, what have we done to allow this narrative of human rights as risk to become the dominant one 
and what can we do to correct this? Perhaps this will involve resetting our compass such that the goal of our movement, our business and human rights movement, is to deliver emancipation from a system that keeps abuses, uh, abuses and abusive practices intact. That is arguably a different goal from what the movement has now, which is to make the system less tolerant about abuse, but nevertheless accepting that the abuse is so baked in to our ability to function that we can't eradicate that abuses completely. Let me stop there and I'm happy to take follow up questions around social movements um, and the defense of, of the space for human rights defenders in questions later. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sumi. Uh, uh, very, very uh, powerful uh, points made here. I think you said at the beginning that you'll make this available. I do encourage you to make that available and, and we'll do whatever possible to, to pass on this message that were sent to you, certainly via video, because this very session will be made available, but uh, your messages were very powerful, very articulated, uh, unequivocal. Uh, I, I like your point of, of looking at the bottom-up leadership, or, so the bottom-up taking again the leadership and and the top-down oxygenating that leadership. That's, that's a very uh, powerful statement. When it comes to reflecting that and, and in doing a, a deep diagnostic of, of the barriers uh, uh, to this, um, obviously I, I, I would in, uh, encourage you and others to look at a report that, that does some of it. There's no question that that reflection needs to be deepened. But I think Dr. Matthew Mullen has in his study um, started up that analysis and, and, and you'll find that uh, um, very interesting. I'll, I'll close by the, the point you made on defending civil space. Uh, was made uh, in my introduction, was made by Dante and, and of course it was reinforced by you. It's absolutely critical if we want to move to, uh, towards leadership from, from the, uh, the, the bottom up that civil space is, um, is defended uh, and legitimized. So thank you very much again, uh, Sumi. Hopefully we'll, we'll come back to you later. Um, I'd like now to invite uh, to take the virtual floor Masayo Ogawa, Assistant Director for Human Rights at uh, the Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs Division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Thank you very much uh, for being with us, uh, Ms. Ogawa. So, Masayo-san, when, when looking at the glass half full, to, 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 to use the expression that uh, Dante referred to, the, when we look at the glass half full of the first de decade of implementation of the UNGP, the observers also, they were contacted by the report, pointed mostly to the role of NAPS, and the awareness raising role that the very process of drafting these NAPs uh, beyond the very document have been playing in Asia in the last five years. Japan was the second country in Asia to officially adopt a standalone NAP after Thailand. So it would be very useful for us to hear your reflections on how the very process that led to the drafting of the NAP unfold uh, in Japan and perhaps hear a bit about two of the priorities that, that I, I found most interesting uh, in your NAP, uh, uh, the, the um, putting a, a mechanism in place uh, to promote um, remedies and, and also placing a, an emphasis on, on respect for human rights uh, throughout supply chains. Um, so can you tell us more about it, uh, Ms. Ogawa? The floor is yours. I believe you might have a PowerPoint presentation to guide your presentation. Thank you. I cannot hear uh, Masayo-san. I hope that the technical facilitator can uh, help out Do you with hear that. Me now? Yes, I can hear you well. You can now speak. Thank you. Thank you, Livio. And first, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to be part of this forum. I appreciate the support the organizers and the moderator you have extended to this forum. So please allow me to share with you that the NAP formulation process played a significant role in implementing the UN guiding principle at the national level in Japan, especially by bringing stakeholders together and then deepening the understanding of the business human rights agenda.
So um, advances in the globalization business activities have shown a light on human rights business, human rights issue in business. Considering this, in 2016, the government of Japan has initiated its process to formulate a national action plan on business human rights. Our policies reflect this commitment. For example, the cabinet approved growth strategy 2018 listed that formulation process as an important measure that encouraged companies to advance forward thinking initiative on respecting human rights in business. We also consider the NAP formulation to be one of the measures to achieve the SDGs. As mentioned, our intention to formulate the NAP and SDGs implementation guiding principle. And as you can see in the slide, in October 2020, Japan launched our first ever NAP to implement the guiding principle. This NAP lists a series of measures related to business and human rights to be implemented by the government. It also clarifies relevant policies across the ministries and agencies from the perspective of business and human rights. Moreover, it sets, our, it sets up expectation for companies to promote introducing human rights due diligence in business. So today I'd like to highlight three reflection points regarding the NAP formulation process, which could be helpful when implementing the guiding principle. Uh, the next slide, oh yes, <laughs> thank you. So first, Considering how the business and human rights agenda covers a wide range of areas, we established an interministerial committee composed of 15 different agencies and ministries. The interministerial discussion helped with sharing information and then having mass communication among ministries. Of course, it was not easy to coordinate different views, uh, especially when we started the baseline assessment in the initial stage of the process because the business and human rights agenda was relatively new concept. But a series of discussions we had over, it, over years increased the understanding of the importance of efforts concerning business and human rights. So we hope that this serves as a basis for implementing the NAPS and ensuring policy coherence on business and human rights. Second, so uh, when formulating our NAP, we considered it essential to ensure a process that enable us to gain diverse input, including thorough participation of diverse stakeholders and then public comment procedures. From the initial stage of formulation process, when we conduct the baseline assessment, we organized a series of consultation with multi stakeholders. And in the formulation process, we set up an advisory committee and a working group composed of experts and their stakeholders from different fields, such as the business sector, including SMEs, the financial sector, the labor sector, consumer organization, bar association, academia, and civil society organization. While we paid attention to have various input, we thought it was also key to have views of consumers who could be affected but also could potentially influence corporate behavior. So because of a wide range of areas the basic human rights agenda covered, it took quite some time to identify stakeholders at the beginning. Indeed, the multi-stakeholder engagement showed the complexity of the agenda to deal with and distilled lesson learned. I would also like to add that during the formulation process, we also invited the public, comment, public for comments twice to express various views on it. And not only having domestic views, but we also obtained views from international experts, including uh, Dante, who is also present at this session. Thank you. So having the understanding of the importance of the multi-stakeholder engagement going forward, um, we will work on implementing the NAP by continuing dialogue with diverse stakeholders. And thirdly, and lastly, by going through all this process, we have realized that this process itself has greatly helped stakeholders, including government ministries, 
to deepen the understanding of the peace and human rights agenda. Since the, uh, since the last of the NAP, more attention has been paid domestically to respecting human rights in business. I noticed more media coverage about this topic with a particular focus on human rights due diligence. More discussion in the diet has been observed as well. So to close, I'd like to emphasize that the NAP has created a common language among different stakeholders which is quite important when we continue to work on advancing human rights in business. I think the time is up. Thank you, Livio. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Masaya, for, for being, uh, staying uh, uh, absolutely within the time allocated and being at the same time uh, very, very informative. Um, I picked up a, a, a few points uh, from, from you. Uh, certainly, I like your reference to the dialogue must continue. You pointed to the the, 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 the aspect of multi-stakeholder approach taken during the drafting of the NAP, but I, I, I take the point on, which I think is very important on, on, on committing to that dialogue or continuing uh, during the implementation of the NAP. I'm sure Kunara Lak will go to that, Thailand being the other country that has adopted the National Action Plan um, on Business and Human Rights. I, I like your reference to now a common language having been adopted uh, so uh, stakeholders in Japan are tuning in into what business and human rights is. The role of media, very important one. I take the opportunity to point to a session on the role of media in business and human rights, an era that hasn't been um, looked at enough in my view that I think it's actually going to be from my point of view of a participants, one of the most interesting session that will be organized uh, uh, later, uh, uh, I think tomorrow or the day after. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Masayo, for, for, your, um, for your very rich uh, contribution. I'd like to um, invite now Dr. Uh, Mualimin Abdi, who is the Director General of the Directorate General of Human Rights in the Ministry of Law and Human Rights. Uh, of the government of Indonesia, and he's, uh, the, the Ministry of Law and Human Rights is also the new focal point for business and human rights uh, um, since, I believe, uh, this year. So, Dr. Mualimin, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have just heard uh, from the representative of a country that has already adopted an app. Now, Indonesia is also in the process of adopting one. The process has been ongoing for, for quite some time. I've been honored and happy to be part of that process since the very beginning. Uh, um, of course, the process is, is, is long also because of the very size of Indonesia and its population, and, and also because of the decision that I remember vividly to conduct consultations also at decentralized level. I think this is a very important aspect of the dialogue, right? Because too often dialogues and, and, and uh, uh, take place only at the capital level, right? Uh, which doesn't really reach uh, the, sometimes the, the, those left most behind. So again, the report uh, which we presented today speaks about this process uh, in Asia that focus, as I said, too much at the capital level. I'd like, um, I'd like you to, to inform the participants of the forum about the progress in drafting of the NAP in Indonesia. That's something we all want to hear about but also perhaps most specifically here, your views on what was the experience of the Ministry of Law and Human Rights in consulting at the provincial level. I know that your ministry uses the methodology of consulting at the provincial level, not only on business and human rights, on many other aspects. So that methodology, I think, is something which is very important and, and may inspire, hopefully, representative of other governments that, that are tuning this conversation. So the, the floor is yours, Dr. Mualimin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Livio. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, distinguished panelists and moderator. Mr. Dante Peske, Chair, UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Ms. Masai Ogawa, representative of the Government of Japan. Uh, Ms. Nairelu, representative of the Royal Thai Government, Ms. Sami Danarajan, Forum of the Future. Kemudian Mr. Xian Xiaohui Liang, China National Textile and April Council. 
Mr. Livio Sarandrea from uh, UNDP. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, on behalf of the government of the Republic Indonesia, I wish to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this panel to discuss business and human rights in Asia from the first decade, decade to the next. I feel honored to be surrounded by important delegation and panelists whose contribution have been remarkably significant in advancing the global agenda of the promotion and protection of human rights in the business sector. I believe our meeting today will be useful to open our view to the implementation of business and human rights in the region and strengthening the commitment of the region to implement the UNGPs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the commitment of Indonesia on human rights is implemented by the government in various efforts to continue to ensure that human rights are always at the center of policy making, including in policy carried out to restore the economic situation as well as in the policy related to the business and human rights. As a proponent of the establishment of UNGPs in June 2011, the government of Indonesia has continued to encourage the implementation and dissemination of UNGPs through of a number of socialization activities with relevant stakeholders. Nevertheless, the government of Indonesia also note that some challenges in implementing the business and human rights principle remain at the national level, such as overlapping of human rights instruments, lack of the coordination between the player, lack of awareness or this on business and human rights, no clear mechanism on risk assessment and remedy. However, these various challenges do not become an obstacle for the Indonesian government to remain committed to respecting and amplifying the principle of business and human rights. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia has built numerous concrete steps which step which have been conducted intensively by the government to promote business activity that is sustainable with human rights value since 2013 involving numerous stakeholders, civil society organizations, academic and private sector. The national focal point on business and human rights has been appointed since 2017 under the Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs. And since 2020, it has been transferred to the Ministry of Law and Human Rights under the coordination of the Directorate General of Human Rights to strengthen Indonesia's commitment in fulfilling and respecting aspects of human rights. Simultaneously, the Ministry of Law and Human Rights also acts as the coordinator of the National Task Force on Business and Human Rights, which consists of various key players from various ministries or agencies, business association, civil society organization, and academy. This National Task Force has five primary mandates which are increasing understanding and awareness on business and human rights, develop regulation and policies that support respect on human rights, restoring access 
to address human rights violation due to business activities, increasing compliance of actor to respect human rights, and monitoring and evaluating the implementation of national business and human rights. The task force is also currently drafting the national strategy for business and human rights as a baseline for UNGP's implementation in Indonesia. It is planned to be done in 2021. In a broader, in a broader framework to fulfill the commitment of the government on Indonesia on human rights in the business sector, the national focal point has launched a web-based voluntary self-assessment application to assess companies operational rights related to human rights abuse, named as PRISMA. Indonesia also has a mechanism for non-judicial dispute resolution through the Public Communication Service Unit within Directorate General of Human Rights, which acts as a mediator in dispute resolution outside the judicial mechanism for the business sector. Furthermore, since 2015, the issue of business and human rights also has become an important part of the National Action Plan on Human Rights. In Bahasa Indonesia, we call it RANHAM. Through the preparation and dissemination of business and human rights guidelines, to continue effort to respect business and human rights, Indonesia has further deepened the business, business and human rights aspect in the last national action plan for human rights, which is currently in the final process to be launched with the main focus on children, women, people with disabilities and adult community. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the government of Indonesia is also actively involved in several efforts to implement to sustainable development goals, including activity participate in the voluntary national report. Currently, the government of Indonesia is also in the middle of the process to prepare our voluntary national report 2021 under the coordination of the Ministry of Planning and Development. Related to the palm oil issue, we would like to highlight the result of the study on palm oil which shows that it has a major contribution to the achievement of SDGs compared to all the vegetable oils. To achieve this, Indonesia has introduced the standard and principle on the palm oil industries, which, which is on as Indonesia Sustainable Palm Oil, or uh, ISPO. In this regard, ISPO certification also requires palm oil companies to observe the principle of labor and environmental responsibility which include requirement to guarantee worker right health and safety to ensure for treatment of worker and also environmental standard. Furthermore, related to the fishery industry, Indonesia also has issued the minister of Please, please, please continue, also, I can ask you to wrap up uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdi. Okay. Indonesia also has issued the Minister of Marine, of Fire and Fisheries Regulation concerning human rights certification in the fishery industry and concerning requirement and mechanism for human rights certification in the fishery industry. This business and human rights principles are also ministering in the internal regulation 
of Indonesia State Owned Enterprises. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the opportunity, he also will, I also would like to mention the job creation law or also on as omnibus law, which is aimed to increase the Indonesian economic growth, trade and investment carried out, carry out with a balance on environmental policies. The, inf the, formation, the formation of this law was, was also appreciated by various parties in the international community as a positive effort by the Indonesian government to make Indonesia more competitive by removing large restrictions on investment and providing a signal that Indonesia is open to investment, thereby creating job and fighting property. property. This law also facilitates the growth of the small medium enterprises to maximize their business business and simply and simplify the licensing process and legality and legality required. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, we would like to reaffirm that Indonesia is highly like committed to strengthening the implementation of UNGPs at the domestic, regional, and international level. On this occasion, I also would like to inform you that Indonesia will host the regional conference on business and human rights in the second semester of 2021. This conference will discuss the development, achievement, and challenges ahead of UNGP's implementation in the ASEAN region within the framework of the first decade of UNGP's. Finally, I will end my presentation at this point, and I, I thank you for your kind attention. Terima kasih. Om Santi Santi of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdi, for a, for a very uh, rich uh, presentation. And, and, and no doubt uh, many people have taken notes of, of, the, uh, of what you have achieved or what you have uh, um, signaled and acknowledged uh, uh, remains Thank as a you. challenge. And, and certainly I, I took note of the commitment uh, for a national strategy on business and human rights, the title you have, you have, you have come up with uh, for your NAP to be adopted uh, within 2021. That's, that's very good to hear. And of course, UNDP will, will remain engaged with, uh, with you and other ministry to support that process. Uh, let me now turn to another NAP champion, if I can call it that way. It's, it's time to invite to the virtual forum Okun Narelak, H.I. Yapum, director of the International Human Rights Division of the Department of Rights and Liberties Protection of the Ministry of Justice of Thailand, Kun Narulak. Uh, we've been in many panels together, and it's always a pleasure. You've been part of the business and human rights movement in Asia since what I consider to be the true beginning in 2016. Um, you witnessed, uh, you know, many of its twists and turns, and you've been part of. Uh, one of the main achievements in the first decade in Asia, which is under no doubt the adoption of the Thai NAP. Um, but you have also witnessed the disappointment of civil society and the communities for a process uh, which is not progressing as rapidly as wished in terms of actual impact on the rights holders. So I'd like you to share your view the hurdles found in implementing the NAP um, and talk to us about some of the action that the Royal government of Thailand is taking, perhaps with an emphasis on the consultation that I, 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 I am, I've been following recently was held with CSOs to inform the drafting of a study on anti-type slap measures. Uh, you are very experienced the panelist, so I, I really hope you can stick within uh, the time allocated so that we can also hear from the next panelist and hopefully I have some questions from the floor. 
Uh, floor is yours, Kunarilak. Thank you very much, Olivia. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, um, Olivia. And also, first of all, I'd like to thank the UN agencies for inviting our Ministry of, Ministry of Justice of Thailand to be part of this panel and join the panel with all these with panelists. Before we talk about the obstacle, I would like to highlight on what government has been done to push forward the implementation of the NAP, but particularly emphasize on what you have requested me on the, the work with the CSO. Um, for the civil society sector, the CSO, I think in terms of implementing the NAP, the civil society sector can play a very important role in monitoring the implementation of the NAP. However, when, um, when, when, we, um, doing, when they are doing that job, sometimes they are facing with difficulty or sometimes facing with danger in terms of physical injury or being sued by the, the other side. So in Thai NAP, um, the human rights defender is listed as one of the uh, key priority area under the Thai NAP and also um, um, include as one of the target groups to be protected under the National Human Rights Plan as well, which is the big framework of, framework of human rights policy of the country. The first thing that we do in when we're working on the, with civil society and when we talk about human rights defender, as there is no official definition at the moment in, in law in Thailand. So what we do is that we have to make everyone in the same page. So by we organize a lot of training to explain the role of the human rights defender and tra literally training is provided to our sector to make sure everyone is understand and respect the human right a role of the, the role of the human rights defender and we also invite a representative of CSO to explain and um, and engage them in the panel as well uh, regarding the issue of slap um, due to the fact that a uh, human rights defender as I mentioned earlier is easily become the victim or a target of strategic lawsuit against public participation or slap so in the past in Thailand uh, we have some uh, some legal provision in criminal procedure course procedure court was established were well, proposed also by the uh, court of justice however a lot of feedback there are lots of feedback on the on the um, effective of the uh, enforcement of that provision so currently the government by the national reform commission of thailand has assigned the national anti-corruption commission of thailand to draft the anti-slap act and i hope that this act can provide a comprehensive measure to protect the human rights defender but at the moment the scope of this bill is still discussing um so i'm not sure whether the how broad the scope is but Hopefully, it will cover both the anti-slap case by the government officer and also by the um, business sector as well. However, in order to also create the con why we don't have a at the moment we don't have the law yet, but to have the concrete protection to the human rights defender, Ministry of Justice together with the UNDP is currently study the appropriate measure to protect human rights defender. And also, we also study on the additional measure that could help ensure the effectiveness of the anti-slap law and provision as well. And um, during the, however, during the during the discussion of the anti-slap law in in Thailand, we are all agree and we found that it is maybe it is a better way if we focus more on prevention, prevention of the emerging of slap case uh, is better than provide remedy and. So we think that the Mediation Act in Thailand, which was an act uh, two years ago, can create also a constructive, constructive platform at the community level, whereby both sides of the party can have a constructive dialogue and conflict can be solved in a very, in, and both sides can satisfy with the results. And the Community Mediation Center is currently um, establishing and it will the aim is to set up the mediation community mediation center at every district and sub district across the country so more than 7000 media community mediation center will be established across the country within the, uh, uh, this year and also the next uh, perhaps not not later than the next year and people can get free um, mediation service and also this is a, not only aimed to create a peaceful society but also aimed to create um, reduce the care load case load of the court and also help prevent the slap case as well. 
And for the Ministry of Justice, uh, we regularly provide legal aid, witness protection, and state compensation to the victim of human rights violation, including human rights defender. We also conduct a field visit to the area that are at risk of being in danger and conduct, usually uh, create a uh, dialogue between the stakeholders, try to address the problem. And during the COVID pandemic, um, it may be difficult for people to traveling to access to the legal service. So the access to legal aid, legal aid is now um, under the Ministry of Justice, we are trying to enhance through our form of e-service. So people can have a broader um, access to the legal aid and legal service from the Ministry of Justice. And a number of law also under revision to ensure that protection will be provided to human rights defender for example, Witness Protection and Justice Fund Act. Now, we're moving on to the, your question on the challenge faced during the past one and a half year. This is also uh, include, um, first one is the COVID pandemic. As you may well aware that Thailand adopted the NAP in 29 October 2019, and the beginning of 2020, COVID pandemic emerged in Thailand. So some of the budget was cut to help COVID situation and also uh, activity to push forward implementation at the provincial level was interrupted due to the restriction of traveling. And similar situation also happened in, in capital as well when the meeting and seminar were not allowed. We are trying to conduct the workshop online, and, but technic technical difficulty is another challenge when we want to work with the local office. Also from the, our experience and from the feedback of the participants, face-to-face -face meeting is something that they are preferred. So, and it is very, it's more easy to communicate with, with each other and explain. As for business, I am admitted that uh, putting forward implementation during the COVID-19 is quite difficult and very challenging, um, especially with the SME, due to the fact that majority of the business sector in Thailand are SME and they are currently focused on how to survive, not how to respect human rights. So it is not easy to reach and convince them Unlike the big company where they have a full resource, they can, and they are required to follow international standards because they have business transaction with European country. So in the current situation, the most of the business that are folk that are interested in the issue of uh, human rights is, is mostly, uh, majority of them are the large company. Second challenge is on rotation of staff. It's another challenge because both, uh, not only within the government, but also with the business sector as well, because when we usually spend our time and budget in, in build up their capacity and their knowledge on UNGP or at responsible business conduct, but when they rotate to another position and someone replace them, the process of training has to restart again. So we have to um, build up the awareness. Racing is something that we have to continue working on it. And this challenge is linked to the, another, uh, the third challenge. The third challenge is on different level of awareness on human rights and responsible business conduct. From our experience, we have found that among business, level of responsible business and human rights knowledge is different. Big companies are more well aware of importance of human rights and responsible business, whereas the SME tends to have less awareness on, and do not understand the importance and linkage between human rights and their business operation and supply chain. And so indeed, it is indeed important to make everyone in the same page, both um, big company and SME. And at this point, I want to highlight that the, uh, Thailand is going to set, uh, create the Business and Human Rights Academy as a regional hub of knowledge on, on, for ASEAN in uh, responsible business conduct and, and business and human rights. And I hope the Academy will have chance to welcome all of you soon. The fourth, the last Thank but you. not least challenge is, no, is the balance between the needs and expectation of different sector because each different sector has different uh, with different design and different perspective and see things from different perspective. So we as a middleman has to try to compromise between different sectors. And the last one is on the lack of trust. Uh, unfortunately, this challenge is still remain. And this is the most important. We need to build trust, create um, connection between people on the ground, business and government. And sometimes we were pushed back by business and sometimes we were pushed back by CSO. So I'm, I'm, I'm aware that the, the trust, it, trust is something that is take time to create, but I would emphasize here that we need to see each other as a partner, not an enemy and not our, and not opposite side and try to create constructive dialogue and being sincere to each other 
and move forward the same goal for the benefit of the country and the region as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kunara Lak. What, what, a, what a great way to, to end up on building trust, acknowledging that trust is still incomplete and pointing to the importance of Dava. That was only one of the many, many points uh, you have made, Kunara Lak. I wish we had time to unpack them all, but I, at this stage, I'll, I'll thank you very much for highlighting all the complexities and acknowledging uh, uh, the challenges. Um, I, I, I think the government of Thailand is very lucky to have you uh, leading on the implementation of business human rights agenda, somebody very, very knowledgeable and, and certainly committed to that. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, one very important panelist uh, still that I want to uh, bring in and I want to try to uh, leave some space for questions and answers. But, so uh, let me flag one question that has come up uh, and I'll probably ask at the end uh, Dante to, uh, to, to, um, to answer. Uh, and, and, and kind of use it for him to wrap up a bit the conversation. And it's a question on remedies. I do notice we haven't we haven't uh, talked a lot about remedies. Is it the forgotten pillar again? So next decade and remedies is something that perhaps I'd like you, Dante, to think a little bit about and come back with a few points uh, at the end. Uh, hopefully we'll have time for more questions, but I now want to give uh, the floor to uh, our final panelist. Um, uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Xiao Liang, uh, Xiao Liang, who is the depu uh, deputy head uh, of the Office for Social Responsibility of the China National Textile and Apparel Council, but also wears many other hats, including uh, adjunct professor at the Law School of Peking uh, uh, University. Uh, I'll ask one question and, and include part of another question that came from the floor. So at, le at least we, we, give the, we give voice to two questions that have come from the floor. So uh, shall we, the report presented uh, um, today on the status of, of obesity and rights in Asia plays a lot of focus on the understanding or lack of the off of the NGPs by the business sector. Many business actors were interviewed and perhaps not surprisingly, the knowledge of the UNGPs, we have heard it from, from other panelists, uh, especially among SMEs was registered as very low. The report highlighted also very different levels of awareness and compliance of responsible business standards in different parts of Asia. I would like to ask for your reflection. Looking back at the first decade, how much did the needle move in China? when it comes to embracing uh, the UNGPs. Uh, the, the, the author of the report points to concerted engagement in China as a priority. That's one of the recommendations, given its pervasive influence and impact on the economy. Uh, and here is I bring in the questions from the floor, which was making reference to that same point, you know, given the importance of, of, of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, how, uh, again, can we connect uh, 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 with, with China on, uh, on business and human rights and make sure that business and human rights becomes part of the, of, of, of the operations of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Shoei. Uh, thank you, Livo, and uh, all the organizers. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to join this session. Um, uh, I'm, I'm more excited to see, you know, business and human rights is developing so fast in Asian countries. Uh, I think Livio just asked the, the same very important question from two aspects. One regarding the development of, uh, you know, uh, business and human rights or responsibilities and impacts of UNGPs in China in the last decade. And uh, one about the future of responsible business uh, in China and their impacts in other countries, including uh, BRI. Um, let me try to answer this question with a review of the business human rights or RBC move in China in the last uh, decade. Uh, generally, as one of the witnesses and also participants of, uh, uh, of the business and human rights or RBC movement in China, I personally think we actually experienced a golden age of business human rights in China in the last decade. Uh, firstly, the awareness of Chinese businesses and general public on CSR, RBC, business and human rights has come, a, has come to a historical high. Social media platforms now frequently present good stories and bad stories about corporate impacts on people, the environment and the society 
to over a billion people in just a few hours or minutes. I think this is a fundamental change that we didn't have a decade ago. You know, as a result of this heightened social scrutiny, business now more than ever care about their image and also social prints, uh, social footprints. And secondly, in the last decade, we have seen the prioritization and the integration of sustainability responsible business in an unprecedented number of policies regarding domestic and overseas investment, trade and investment agreements, national human rights action plans, and global governance com commitments as well. For instance, since 2011, the Chinese overseas investment policies witnesses a total transition from protecting Chinese investment, property, and pers personnel to guaranteeing social license based on responsible business and a social and environmental due diligence. Unprecedented new rules and the provisions on your mental standards and the labor standards also appeared in bilateral trade agreements between China and the countries such as Switzerland and Iceland. And as you may know, last year in the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, the Chinese government has made commitment in promoting responsible business and working towards the ratification of the outstanding ILO fundamental conventions, including the two ILO fundamental conventions on forced labor that China has, has not yet uh, ratified. And the last November, President Xi Jinping announced that China is considering joining the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, which, as we all know, has a much higher standards in human labor rights and environmental protection, etc. And the two national human rights action plans covering the period of 2012 to 2020 both called for human rights education for businesses. And one of them further provided that respect for human rights shall be a key consideration element in domestic and overseas investment. And with regard to global governance, in the past decade, China has joined hands with other countries, for instance, of the G20, and committed to build a responsible and resilient global supply chain. China was one of the first countries in the world that has issued its progress reports on SDGs since 2017. And uh, we, uh, we just talked about the Belt and Road Initiative. In the joint communique of the Leaders' Roundtable of the Second Belt and Road Forum for International Collaboration in, in April 2019, China and other countries call on all market players in the Belt and Road Cooperation to fulfill their corporate social responsibility and follow principles of UN uh, Global Compact. And uh, as we know, the first uh, two and the uh, six principles are about human rights and labor rights. And in 2020, China made the commitment of carbon neutrality by 2020, 2060, which forms an important part of uh, global vision on tackling climate change. Uh, just yesterday, the Chinese Ministry of Ecology and Environment issued a very important regulation to require carbon emissions shall be included in the future environmental impact assessment of projects. Last but not least, in the last decade, we have also seen aggressive and pro pro proactive business commitment and practices in respecting human rights also without a parallel in history. For instance, as of today, all, uh, around 500 Chinese companies have joined the Global Compact. And actually the number has doubled in the past two years. And every year over 2,000 Chinese com companies publish their CSR or sustainability or ESG reports with more and more disclosure on human rights. And the, at the, at the, uh, at the industry level, over a dozen of business associations, including those in garment, mining, infrastructure, ICT, agriculture, and the forestry, uh, have issued social responsibility or sustainability or supply chain due diligence guidance or standards. And many of them actually make clear reference to the UNGPs, including the one made by the small and medium-sized enterprise council of China, which is about, uh, you know, 
the SMEs in China. And uh, along with this encouraging development, we know, the, we know that the, the expectations of stakeholders for Chinese business are also growing, while the external environment for business to engage in responsible business is not getting better. This, of course, is further challenging the commitment and the capacities of businesses in implementing building human rights and the responsible business strategies. And I believe which in turn also demand more tailored guidance of the government of the policies, as well as more constructive engagement and the collaboration of stakeholders. And uh, finally, one may ask, can we contribute this, this development in China, at least partly to the UNTPs? I think the, the answer is yes. Indeed, so far, as far as I know, except the various statements made by Chinese diplomats in the UN Human Rights Council, there's no government policy or statement, statements that has made clear reference to the UNGPs. And indeed, the visibility of the UNGPs in China is still very low. Nevertheless, the essence, principles, and the methodology of the UNGPs are well recognized and utilized in state policies and business practices alike. You know, people walk on roads whose name they may not know. So let's call this a case of principled pragmatism as embraced by the UNGPs. I will stop here and uh, thank you. Uh, over to you, Livo. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Shaoi, for giving us uh, your your perspective on, on developments uh, in, in China. Uh, thank you for highlighting uh, some progress that you pointed to, but also making sure that the gaps exist, uh, namely the no clear state policy at this stage. Uh, thank you for flagging an environmental and, uh, and, uh, uh, and climate change as entry points for, uh, business and human rights, for, for greater engagement on business human rights uh, with uh, with China, again, uh, thank you for your perspectives. Uh, we must acknowledge that the perspectives uh, on, on the engagement of China with business and human rights also uh, uh, may differ from yours, from, from some other people, but I thank you very much for, for your uh, contribution today. I really, uh, I've asked for, for a few more minutes uh, to the technical facilitators to give the floor back to Dante and ask him to wrap up the session with a comment on, uh, on the pillar tree on remedy and then saying also that there is a, a whole other sessions on remedy in the program later on but a few words for you dante on on uh, remedy in the next decade and then we'll wrap up with you dante. thank you uh livio i have uh, many pages of notes that i have been taken <clears throat> sadly i will not be able to comment on, on all of those points because there are <clears throat> there are so many uh so First of all, thank you for all the ones that have intervened in this uh, rich, uh, in the, let's say, conversation. Um, I would like to say two things. One, a short reaction to uh, Sumi about emancipation. Uh, I fully agree with you on that point. And in my cultural context, it's about liberation. And liberation is about empowerment. Empowerment of people, of the ones that are powerless, the ones that are in the bottom. And, uh, and I, 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 that resonates very clearly with me. Um, and I, I'm just making the, the cultural transition, uh, what in my context will be called liberation uh, of people. You're free or you're liberated as you are empowered um, as, a, as a human. Um, so that's one thing that I fully agree. The other thing is a, a reminder to all of you, especially the ones that work and represent governments, on the 28th of June, I will make the presentation to the Human Rights Council regarding the 10th an the anniversary and the stock taking uh, report. And there will be an opportunity for governments to ask for the floor and to speak up. Governments will have three minutes for interventions um, to say whatever they want to say in favor, against, etc. Our expectation is, is not to be, let's say, uh, uh, greeted too much, but is to raise the ambition, is the opportunity to make commitments, um, to uh, reflect on targets, on goals, on perhaps uh, mandatory measures 
catching up with the Europeans. Uh, so is the opportunity to raise the ambition in public. Uh, and that will be the 28th of June. And all of you, of course, are invited. All governments are invited to take the floor. Uh, but is the opportunity to, to speak up, basically, uh, and to support this, this agenda. That will be our ideal scenario. And finally, regarding remedy. Uh, what I want to say is remedy is the reality check. Um, all what we do regarding pillar one and governments, pillar two and business, at the end of the day, where it's that the reality check, testing to reality, is the access to remedy. When governments fail in their duties, when business fail in their responsibilities, what happens to real people? What's the journey that they have to, to transition? What is the experience they have to go through? Uh, what are the practical obstacles they face? What is the reality? So in bottom line, uh, everything we can, be, we, we can discuss forever on pillar one and two, but at the end of the day, that is the reality check. What happens with the people that suffer? Uh, and what Thank is you. their first hand real experience when things go wrong? Despite all the good intentions of all of us, when things go wrong, what happens to real people with a real name? And that's the reality check that at the end of the day puts our, our score on how good or bad we have delivered and have done our job. So thanks again. Thank you. By the way, I'm finishing my mandate as member of the working group on the 31st of October. So effectively, this is my final words at least in this annual forum in, 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 in Asia, wearing the hat of the Working Group on Business and Human Rights. So it has been a great honor to engage with you again. And of course, I will engage with you in other capacity in the future, certainly, uh, but at least from the Working Group perspective, this is my final intervention. So thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Dante. Big applause to you, and I, and I know I represent the views of all those who are tuning into this conversation to give you a big, big thanks for everything you've done for the Business and Human Rights Discourse globally and more specifically in Asia. We could say a lot more, but we really need to close here to give space to the other session to be prepared. I thank all the panelists very much and indeed all the participants. Please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.